Well, welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us today. For those who don't know me, I am Darlene McLennan and I'm the manager of the Australian Disability Clearinghouse on Education and Training, ADSET for short. This webinar is being live captioned today by the wonderful Bradley Reporting. To activate the captions, you can click on the CC button in the toolbar that is located either at the top or the bottom of your screen. We also have captions available via a browser and we'll put that into the chat box now. Um, and we'll keep putting that in for the next five minutes just if you, people turn up late. All right, I just want to start by acknowledging um, that ADSET is hosted on Latrobita, Tasmania, Aboriginal land. And in the spirit of reconciliation, ADSET respectfully acknowledges the Latrobita nations and also recognises the Aboriginal history and culture of the land and pay our respects to elders past, present, and to the many um, Aboriginal people that did not make elder status. I also want to acknowledge all countries participating in this meeting and acknowledge the elders and ancestors and the legacies to us and their legacies to us and any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people participating in the webinar. Um, just as a way of um, connecting and, um, you know, being a part of this webinar, we invite you now in the chat to, um, to acknowledge what land you are on today. And thank you for doing that. Okay, today's webinar, Disability Discrimination in the Tertiary Sector, the DDA, the DFE. This is being presented by the wonderful Dr. Elizabeth um, Dixon, who is a senior lecturer at Law School, Univers Queen University, Queensland University of Technology. Sorry, Jason, for your wonderful captioning there. Um, it's fabulous to have Elizabeth with us. We've been working with her for a number of months to get her on board for this webinar because it's one of the things that we get up asked the most and it's been something we've been working to, ha um, to um, have happen for a number of years. So it's fabulous that Elizabeth has committed the time and, and dedication to putting this presentation together. Um, a number of people asked questions um, prior to the webinar and Elizabeth will try to wrap that into her presentation. Um, and at the end of the session, we'll um, also enable people to ask questions. So if you have any burning questions, um, yeah, let us know. Before I hand over to Elizabeth, I, we just have a couple of housekeeping details. Um, for those who haven't joined us before, um, just to let you know, the webinar is um, being recorded and will be on ADSET in the coming days. And also, um, as I said at the beginning, we are live captioning this event and the wonderful Jason from Bradley Recording is doing that for us. If you are experiencing any technical difficulties throughout the presentation, you can email us at admin at <coughs> adset.edu.au. We will also be tweeting. So if you want to share your experiences on Twitter, um, you the hashtag tag will probably be, will include the ADSET hashtag or at ADSET, so you can join us there on that. Uh, Elizabeth will talk for about 45 to 50 minutes and then we'll have 10 minutes to ask questions. If you would like to ask a question, please write that, put that into the Q&A box, not the chat box. The chat box we leave for you to have conversations with each other and with us. Um, so feel free to, to make any comments or um, have a general chit chat in the chat box. But if you have any um, questions, please, that add, please add that to the Q&A box. We also have enabled upvoting. And so you can actually um, vote for your favourite question, which will put that to the top of the, um, the stream for me to find easily. Okay, that's it for housekeeping and that's it for the intro. Now I'm gonna um, hand over to you, Elizabeth. Thank you so much once again for joining us. It's fabulous to have you on board and looking forward to the presentation. Thank you, Darlene. So I'll be covering quite a bit of territory today. Forgive me if I go very quickly. I'm trying to get through as much as I can in the amount of time available. The slides that I've put together are mostly for my benefit so that I have prompts to speak to. So feel free to ignore the slides and just to listen to what I'm saying, if that works for you. So the first thing I'll be doing is uh, just giving a brief refresher on the DDA. And I'll be looking to it a couple of limitations on the protection under the DDA that have become apparent in a recent case. And I'll also be giving a brief refresher on the DSE. 
Now, I expect that most of you listening will have a very good understanding of the legislative framework already. So I'll go quite quickly when I look at that stuff. Then I want to focus on four issues that are apparent in the tertiary sector particularly. And I don't purport to have all of the answers in respect of these issues, but um, I'd like to have a go at explaining how the law might work in the context of these issues. So the first one is disclosure. Then I want to look at inherent requirements. Then at interrupted course progression. Then at disability-related challenging behaviour. I'm very happy to answer your questions at the end or afterwards. My email address was on the very first slide. Uh, but your questions are appreciated if they are something to do with the law. I, I need to say at the outset that um, I am not an expert in the range of adjustments that are available for people with disabilities. Um, that's beyond my expertise, but I, I do know a bit about the law. So happy to answer those kinds of questions. So disability discrimination then we, we know that there's not just federal legislation in this area, there's state legislation as well. There are two tiers of legislation. And both of those tiers of legislation at the federal and the state level uh, prohibit discrimination by education authorities, education institutions against students with disability. So from my point of view here in Queensland, we're regulated by both the DDA and the Anti-Discrimination Act, which is a generic um, discrimination act, and it prohibits discrimination on a range of um, protected attributes, including disability, or as the legislation here says, impairment. So students may choose if they are aggrieved uh, to bring an action against a tertiary institution under either federal or state legislation. And the education institution that's being sued doesn't really have any say in uh, the venue of that claim. Uh, if a complaint is accepted though, it'll be handled uh, much the same at the state level and at the federal level. There'll be a conciliation at first instance to try to settle the issues as between the parties. If the conciliation fails, then there may be an opportunity for a hearing, for a trial in inverted commas in respect of the issues. At the federal level, that trial will be, for, will be before a court, either the Federal Circuit and Family Court of Australia or the Federal Court of Australia. If it's brought under state legislation, it will likely be for a tribunal, one of the super tribunals like VCAT or um, QCAT in Queensland. But my focus today is on the DDA and can pretty much take confidence um, from, from this. If you are compliant with the DDA, it's highly likely that you would also be compliant with the state legislation such is the degree of um, consistency between the two levels of legislation. Rightio, discrimination now. Now there are two varieties of discrimination, direct and indirect. Legislation, anti-discrimination legislation will also prohibit other kinds of um, behavior such as harassment and victimization, but I won't be looking at them specifically today. Direct discrimination is, is quite easy to understand. It sort of a, appeals to that inherent notion of, of fairness that we all have within us. We don't like seeing people treated differently and unfairly. And direct discrimination is different treatment, less favorable, different treatment. Now, whether treatment is less favorable is determined by comparing the treatment of the person with the disability with the treatment of a person without the disability in circumstances which are not materially different. 
Now, those of you familiar with the famous Purvis case will know that the High Court has sort of hashed this up a bit. And I'll be making a few references to Purvis later in the presentation. There is an express limit on direct discrimination as well, and that is unjustifiable hardship. If an education institution can show that to avoid the discrimination would subject them to unjustifiable hardship, then that exemption will render the discrimination lawful. Now, unjustifiable hardship's been very controversial over the years, but it's present significance has probably been superseded by a focus now on reasonableness, as we'll see, on the reasonableness of the treatment. The classic example of less favourable treatment is excluding someone because they have a disability or refusing to enrol someone because they have a disability. And one of the early cases in this area uh, was the Scarlet Finney case. And some of you might remember that where a, a child was refused enrolment at an independent school in New South Wales because she used a wheelchair. And the school said that to enrol her would have imposed unjustifiable hardship because they would have had to modify their campus, uh, which was a hilly campus. The court found that Scarlett had been discriminated against, directly discriminated against, and that the school had catastrophized the impact upon them of enrolling her. Uh, the court didn't accept the arguments that they made about the extent of the adjustments that they'd have to make to their campus. And so unjustifiable hardship wasn't proved. Now, indirect discrimination, the other variety of discrimination, is a little bit more difficult to understand because it arises potentially when everyone is treated in the same manner. Everyone is treated the same, whether they have a disability or they don't have a disability. And from that treatment, it's possible to extrapolate a condition. So a condition is placed upon the inclusion of the person with the disability. This condition is usually inferred from the facts. The DDA then asks us to look at whether the person with the disability can comply with that condition. And then the issue is whether the condition is likely to have the effect of disadvantaging persons with disability. And finally, the condition must be not reasonable. So reasonableness is an express limit on indirect discrimination. If treating everyone in the same way is reasonable, then there will not be a um, uh, unlawful discrimination. So the classic examples of um, indirect discrimination uh, often arise in the context of steps where a building or a venue is accessible only by steps. And my own university was involved in, in such a case um, that arose out of the protocols for graduations at QUT. So at QUT, back in the time of Mr. Kinsella, who brought this claim, Everyone had to climb a set of steps to go onto the stage to receive their degree, their certificate, and then they'd climb back down the steps to sit back in the body of the hall uh, with the rest of their uh, graduating class. Now, Mr. Kinsella couldn't do that because he used a wheelchair. The university said, oh, well, that's okay. You can wait out in the wings and you can just roll across onto the stage and then roll back into the wings when you've got your certificate. He wasn't happy with that solution. He brought a claim and the uh, tribunal agreed with Mr. Kinsella that graduation was about much more than just receiving a bit of paper. It was about participating with your graduating class in the ceremony itself. And the solution that QUT postulated would have excluded Mr. Kinsella from that participation. Now, QUT then came up with a universal design solution where everybody sat on the stage um, and uh, good, cost-neutral cost um, uh, solution. Everyone sits on the stage, including the students, and there's no need for the climbing of steps. 
Now, since 2009, it's also been possible to prove discrimination in the DDA if there's been a failure to make reasonable adjustment, which has manifested then as less favourable treatment or as the imposition of an unreasonable condition. So I've got the relevant uh, sections of legislation extracted there for you to look at later. But um, even before these amendments, in a practical sense, it was often necessary to make reasonable adjustment in order to avoid discrimination. So before the um, DSA came into effect, before these amendments to the DDA, um, ramp access was provided for people with mobility impairment. We were providing assistive technology we were giving extensions on assignments and so on. Because the reality was that even before this imposition of the obligation to make reasonable adjustments, a failure to do so might have actually resulted in discriminatory treatment. Now, there was a decision a bit over five years ago called Sklavos that involved a doctor who was seeking admission to the College of um, Dermatologists. Now, Dr. Sklavos had an exam phobia and he was unable to sit the written exams that had been set by the college for those seeking admission to the college. He wanted the college to make what he uh, advanced as the reasonable adjustment of developing an assessment regime particular to him and to his disability which would have involved um, more Viva style assessment on the job assessment as well. Now, the court found, and this case was appealed and the appeal court agreed that there had been no direct or indirect discrimination and there hadn't been a failure to make reasonable adjustments either. But in reaching their decision, they managed to say a couple of things which actually messed up the utility of the obligation to make reasonable adjustments in the DDA itself. Because they looked at the way it was inserted into the Act, they focused on particular words, and they said in respect of direct discrimination, this phrase that I've highlighted on the screen, because of the disability, the effect that the aggrieved person is because of the disability treated less favourably, means that the failure to make reasonable adjustment has to be because of the disability. So in this case, they would have had to prove that the college's failure to make reasonable adjustment for Sklavos was because he had a disability. Now, of course, that isn't the reason. It's almost never, I would suggest, be the reason that... Um, an institution failed to make reasonable adjustment. The reason they failed to do it was because it was going to be expensive, it was going to be time consuming, onerous for the people involved, and there was no guarantee that even had they developed this um, uh, personalised assessment regime that Dr Sklavos would have been able to complete it. Now, there was a similar uh, missing around with um, with um, indirect discrimination because in respect of indirect discrimination now I'm, I'm they found that if a condition was found to be reasonable for the purpose of the original version of indirect discrimination then there would be no look, need to look at whether a reasonable adjustment should be made which essentially then cut out consideration of reasonable adjustment for the purpose of indirect discrimination. But as I've noticed, noted above, um, we already had situations before the obligation to make reasonable adjustment where cases had found that a failure to do certain things to accommodate disability did in fact result in indirect discrimination. And so this ramification of the decision in Sklavos is probably less catastrophic for uh, indirect discrimination 
because there's still the opportunity to look at reasonableness in the context of um, indirect discrimination itself. I hope that makes sense to you. It's very complicated to explain the reasoning of the court here. But think about it this way. Um, you have to be able to climb steps to access the building. That's a condition that's imposed. If the institution installs a ramp, the condition is removed and there's no discrimination that can be alleged. If, however, the institution doesn't install a ramp, the condition remains and there's the potential to bring an, a, a case of indirect discrimination and then the court will look at whether it's reasonable that the ramp hasn't been installed. If it's not reasonable, then there will be a finding of discrimination. Let's move on to the standards now, because of, of course the standards can, can make up uh, to some extent for some of the shortcomings of the DDA, because they impose proactive obligations on institutions to do things. They don't have to wait to be sued to respond. They have these obligations to be proactive under the standards. The standards are passed under the authority of the DDA. Um, theoretically, compliance with the standards uh, results in compliance with the DDA, which suggests a theoretical uh, possibility or, or protection against getting sued. But the reality is that breach of the standards can also be pleaded by students bringing actions against education institutions. And there was some suggestion in Sklavos, even though the DSE do not create uh, specific remedies, that um, it there may a court may be able to order remedies under the DSA, DSE um, themselves. So watch this space. So they cover these key aspects of the delivery of education services. I'm sure you're familiar with that. Uh, for each aspect of the standards, they set out student rights. Now we're not big on articulating express rights in Australian law. So this is, this is quite significant that rights are spelt out in the DSE and Education providers are obliged then to take reasonable steps to ensure those rights are enjoyed on the same basis as other students. They also um, include the standards uh, measures of compliance. But the overarching obligation under the standards is to make reasonable adjustments. Uh, and I've got a, an extract from the standards here, which makes it plain that sometimes treating all students the same way will not mean that they are treated on the same basis as other students. They're not enjoying their rights on the same basis as other students. So reasonable adjustment may be necessary um, for students with disability. Now, one of the early cases on the DSA was a, a school case called Walker. And um, it set out the process that needs to be followed. And this process is essentially uh, set out too in the DSE, but Walker brings it together in a snapshot sense. The first obligation is to consult. You need to talk to the student with disability. At the university level, it will usually be the student with the disability that you're talking to because they will usually be aged 18 or over and will therefore have legal capacity. Uh, secondly, the university, the tertiary institution, the TAFE must consider what reasonable adjustments to normal practices, so forgive the language that the courts use, uh, what should be made to assist the student. Then they have to decide whether that adjustment is necessary. And if it is necessary, then they must implement it. So consultation, what adjustments are available? Is the particular adjustment necessary? Then implement it. Now, consultation isn't defined. And this has been a sore point ever since the standards came into effect. 
and um, the government has been alerted to the fact that that's problematic several times, but no real action has been taken to address the fact that there's no definition. Walker has a crack at it. It says that no particular form or timing for consultation is mandated. Consultation may be formal or informal. It can be instigated either by the institution or by the student. It may occur face-to-face -face or via phone conversations or even in exchanges of correspondence. But uh, we can take away from that at the tertiary level that most of the consultation, the formal consultation anyway, will be conducted on behalf of the institution by disability services staff, usually in the context of the development of an access plan. And I know these plans have different names at different universities. Now, the expectation of the standards is that consultation will occur upon enrollment. And I know that at the tertiary level, it can be actually very helpful if consultation begins before the formal enrollment begins, because there can be a lot of work required to implement adjustments for some students. So there needs to be consultation upon enrollment, the earlier the better to allow for planning. Now, consultation must also continue for the duration of the enrollment to consider any new information that might arise about the disability or about new adjustments that are out there, to assess whether adjustments are working, to consider whether different adjustments might be tried or might be needed. So it's important to schedule then regular consultation, but also to be available should the student initiate a consultation as well. And it's important too to keep cool, to keep good notes and to keep those notes on file. And um, I think all tertiary ed education institutions now have systems in place to affect something like I've described. Where perhaps there is still some deficiency at the tertiary level is in respect of consultation with academic staff. Now, stuff that is disclosed to academic staff may well be treated by a court as having been disclosed to the tertiary institution itself. But in my experience, there isn't a great deal of opportunity for discussion between academic staff and um, disability advisors. Now, that's obviously a time constraint, but it's perhaps a system constraint as well. And I wonder if that is an area looking to the future where we need to do better as tertiary institutions keeping academic staff in the loop um, to provide feedback to disability advisors and for the disability advisors to be assisting academic staff as well. A lot of our focus is on assessment in access plans when increasingly, and particularly with the impact of the NDIS, uh, facilitating higher levels of enrollment for students with more complex disabilities now um, there's increased need for assistance in the classroom, I think, for uh, academic staff. And, you know, I don't know that that assistance is always forthcoming and that may be problematic. problematic. Okay, who decides what's reasonable? The education institution does. But, you know, if you decide something that the student doesn't like, then... You need to be prepared for the consequences, I guess, which may involve litigation, hopefully not, um, but it's up to the institution to decide. There are limits on when an adjustment will be required. By implication, it's not required if it's not reasonable. It's not required if it would cause unjustifiable hardship, if it would be inconsistent with an act authorised by law. Um, more about that later. 
if it would jeopardize the health of a student with disabilities or the health of other students, more about that later as well. Now, reasonableness is a fairly broad inquiry, a discretionary inquiry, which will require a balancing of often competing considerations. What's the nature of the disability? What are the views of the student with the disability? What is the effect on the student of the disability, the effect on the student of the adjustments being sought? What is the effect on others in the educational environment, teaching staff, other students, for example? And what are the costs and benefits? And those costs and benefits aren't limited to costs and benefits for the student with the disability themselves. They, there may be costs and benefits for other people in the school community as well. And then there's a second layer that even if you decide after that balancing act that an adjustment is reasonable, there's a second crack at it if you can prove uh, it would uh, impose unjustified hardship, a second crack at, at avoiding the obligation to make it. But similar things, I've got them listed there, are addressed as part of the balancing act for unjustifiable hardship. And in reality, it's gonna turn on reasonableness. I haven't come across a case in recent times where unjustifiable hardship has been in issue. It's all been dealt with at the level of reasonableness because the same matters are taken into account. On to now the four issues that I'd like to talk about in a little bit more detail. And the first one is disclosure. Now, some students are, for you know, pretty clear reasons, reluctant to disclose disability to an institution. And I know my institution, QUT, has done a lot to um, broaden the, the language being used to invite people to disclose disability. So um, illness, um, injury are words that might be used as well. But the reality is that there is still a, a perception for some people with disability and perhaps they're legitimate with some legitimacy that stigma may attach to a disability, uh, particularly to psychiatric disability, and there may as such be a reluctance to disclose. Now that's going to be problematic if the university hasn't been alerted, there has been no uh, enrollment consultation, no access plan developed, and the disability then does interfere with the student's learning. Um, and at that point, a delayed disclosure is made. So everything we can do to encourage disclosure should be done because it's problematic if it's not disclosed down the track, potentially. Now, early case law in the early years of the DDA suggested that an institution be held liable for discrimination against a person with a disability on the ground of that disability, even if the disability hadn't been disclosed. And Exa is a case in point. In that case, a graduate accountant was employed by the government and um, that graduate accountant had not disclosed that he had been diagnosed with schizophrenia. The schizophrenia manifested for him as difficulty uh, communicating effectively with co-workers and with clients of the government department. And when his um, probation period expired, uh, the government department decided to uh, terminate his employment. Now, it was held in that case because they terminated his employment on the basis of a manifestation of his disabilities, the communication issues, that that was uh, disability discrimination and um, the department was held liable. That was a, an amazingly controversial case at the time for reasons you can, can realise. Uh, now, it's not likely that there would ever be a decision like that again. And if a student were now likely, were going to allege 
discrimination on the basis of an undisclosed disability, there would be some immediate hurdles to their proving their case. And the first one is that in the Purvis case, it was found that the true basis of the discriminatory treatment must be the disability. There needed to be a causal link between the disability and the behaviour. But Purvis also found that the behaviour could be treated separately from the disability that caused it for that purpose, that causation purpose. So in the Purvis case, for example, it was found that the boy who had exhibited low levels of disability related violence uh, could be excluded because the true basis of his treatment wasn't his disability, it was the safety concerns that the principal held for the rest of the school community that motivated the, the uh, principal's um, treatment of uh, the boy in the case. If disability is disclosed to any staff member, I said this earlier, of the education institution, rather than through a formal disclosure process, that might amount to constructive knowledge by the institution. And if appropriate adjustment isn't made by the institution, then, then the institution is vulnerable to a complaint of discrimination. Um, I'm thinking of one case, uh, it, it, it's a, it involved a sports massage school, which shows you how uh, broadly based the coverage of the legislation is. But in that case, the complainant had told his lecturer that he had a disability, but the lecturer hadn't passed that information up the chain. And because of that failure, there was no adjustment made to his assessment regime. If the university had known, it would have given him a uh, longer time to do the assessment. He would have passed the assessment and he would not have been excluded. Now, I wonder whether big education institutions like universities like TAFEs are set up to account for this aspect of disclosure, to collect this kind of information to ensure that appropriate action is taken by the institution. Um, part of the problem here is that I don't think there is sufficient training for academics uh, in respect of how to respond to disability. Um, there have been many attempts made to improve that training, but you know, I know at my own institution, the, the pushback has been, well, there's already so much mandatory training, how much more can we expect our staff to do? And I think that to answer my own question, there is a legislative expectation of adjustment by institutions uh, that may need to occur outside the Disability Advisor Disability Access Plan framework. So I think that's, that's work that needs to be done in the future on improving that, that process. Um, adjustments must be made in a reasonable time. That's another problem that can um, flow from uh, delayed disclosure, failure to disclose, because the DSA, a DSA makes it plain that um, a re well, the reasonableness of the time taken to respond will be influenced by uh, whether the institution has been provided in a timely way relevant information about the disability. And there are a couple of cases out there. They're old cases, they predate the DSE, but essentially in both these cases, it was found that the reasonableness of the university's response was, was affected by failures on behalf of the students to make um, timely disclosure to the institution. So Sluggett, didn't regard herself as having a disability at all, didn't disclose her mobility problems, and then there were uh, problems in accessing uh, the campus, and she brought a claim which was unsuccessful. In Hinchliff, her preferences for adjustments changed over time, but she didn't inform the university in a timely fashion, and so the university's response was 
held to be reasonable in those circumstances. Let's move on now quickly. I'm hooning through this, I know, to inherent requirements statements. I won't read through this slide. I'm just going to summarise it briefly. The legislation, the DSE, allows education institutions to preserve the academic integrity of their courses. Now, it was acknowledged even before the DSE that universities did not need to adjust the level of difficulty of their courses for students with disability who were having difficulty passing those courses. There's one here that's from my own law school, Brackenreg. It was held that we didn't have to reduce the level of difficulty of assessment items just so um, Ms. Brackenreg could pass the law units. A more recent example is Andreopoulos, the um, 2020 case. You can read the extract from that decision on the slide at your leisure. But it says similar things, that you don't have to erode the integrity of the course to a point, a lower point, so that the person with the disability can pass. Now, some universities have gone down the path of developing inherent requirements statements to work in conjunction with this idea of academic integrity. My university hasn't done it, uh, except for a, a couple of instances of courses involving practicum. Um, it could be said that it's useful to articulate inherent requirements if only to compel academics to unpack what is actually inherent to the course that they are delivering. But inherent requirement statements can be a double-edged sword. You might think that it might assist enrollment because you can look at what the inherent requirements are. You can then consider whether adjustments can be made to meet those requirements as part of the consultation process. But there's also some anecdotal evidence that they might be used as shields to stop um, enrollments, to say, look, these are the inherent requirements. We're looking at you. We're making a global assessment of your disability and we don't think you can do it. Now you can't use inherent, restatement, inherent requirement statements in that way legitimately. You can't use them to refuse all adjustments, just those that would compromise the inherent requirements of the course. Uh, you don't have to make the assessment easier to pass, but you may still have to provide extra time, a separate venue, access to assistive technology and so on. So you still need to go through the process of considering reasonable adjustment. Uh, and just because an adjustment is unreasonable in a legal sense doesn't mean that you can still choose to make it. And I'm aware anecdotally too of some institutions that have gone above and beyond and have made what may objectively been unreasonable adjustments for some students. Uh, the provision of full-time one-on-one support staff, for example. Um, I don't want to get into that debate now. Happy to down the track. But you should take care that if you're providing that kind of adjustment for one student, that there may be an expectation that you would be uh, providing that level of adjustment for other students with a similar level of disability as well. And that may then take you down a path of, um, you know, it becomes a financial impost to do so. Uh, identifying inherent requirements is not a simple process and you, you should be prepared to be challenged if you do articulate them. I remember we were looking at course, course learning outcomes in the law school about 10 years ago and there was some discussion about whether we could talk about uh, effective oral communication as a course outcome for a law degree. And we decided, no, uh, we would stick with effective communication because we weren't convinced that we would never enroll a student who could not speak. Uh, we've enrolled plenty of students who can't hear, plenty of students who can't see. Uh, we may well enroll a student who can't speak and be able to adjust our processes to allow that student to meet the inherent requirements of the degree. It's also tempting, but problematic to conflate 
the inherent requirements of a job that a particular course is related to, to the university or TAFE course itself. Uh, this point was addressed in a case called BKY in the University of Newcastle, where a student was um, studying medicine. And part of the pushback against allowing her extra time to complete the degree because of her disability was that, well, you know, this is going to um, affect her capacity to practice. Uh, her degree will be out of date and so on. So we, we have to remember that we are education institutions. There are different conversations to be had by employers, but employers have to make reasonable adjustment. Oh, I'm wagging my finger now, sorry. Um, one problematic thing about inherent requirements is that some universities talk about resilience or behavioral stability as an inherent requirement. Now that, raises alarm bells a bit for me because I think that that's being used as a proxy for mental health in inverted commas. And I would suggest that we routinely as education institutions do make accommodations to um, adjustments to accommodate a lack of resilience. We make adjustments for students with mental health to allow them to continue their enrollment and to be, to finish their degrees. So, is it then legitimate to say that that is an inherent requirement if we can adjust to mitigate that effect? Um, another issue, probably don't have time to talk about it today, is are we actually entrenching a lack of resilience by adjusting for it? Would we be at better institutions if we were assisting students to work on proving their Resilience. Interrupted course progression. I know I'm sort of running um, close to time now, so I'll speed it up. This is a big problem. It's a big problem in the, the degree that I teach in two. Um, students may withdraw, re-enroll, withdraw, fail, have that failure undone, re-enroll. And it gets to a point where you have to wonder whether those adjustments of allowing continued withdrawal and re-enrollment are actually reasonable adjustments in that there is potentially a negative impact on the student with the disability. I know I've had it said to me uh, in respect of a student with chronic severe mental health problems who I was teaching, look, we just have to do everything that we can to support the student's enrollment because it's the only kind of routine or opportunity for success that he currently feels he has in his life. Now, that is an important consideration, but equally, there are negative considerations perhaps around uh, creating a sense of excitement of enrolling and then disappointment of withdrawal, not to mention the financial ramifications that attach to uh, withdrawing and re-enrolling as well. You can see that resilience is particularly, uh, this is maybe where this resilience language is coming from, this behavioral stability language is coming from in inherent requirement statements. Can university courses uh, enforce completion time limits? Um, that's tricky. The BKY case uh, suggested perhaps not if students without disability have been given extra time. So if you've been prepared to waive uh, completion timeframes for students without disability, be prepared to have to extend them uh, for students with disability as well. So in BKY, arguments were raised about currency, about poor performance during the degree, about safety. But the bottom line was the court was prepared to find in that case that disability was the reason that she was refused the extra time and she won her case. Challenging behaviour now. Now, this is, a, is, is certainly an issue. It's um, been uh, an issue, an early issue for the DDA, a long-standing issue. Most of the cases that end up in court these days under the DDA are cases involving 
challenging behavior. Uh, Purvis is the seminal case in this area and the complainant lost his action in the Purvis case because of the way the court, the High Court of Australia, highest court in the land construed direct discrimination. And um, at the same time as the Purvis case was run, there was a similar case being run as an indirect discrimination case. And it was held in that case that it was reasonable for the purposes of indirect discrimination to impose a reasonably adjusted behavior code on a student with disability related challenging behavior. And so a student who couldn't comply with that adjusted behavior code could be lawfully excluded. Now the, the DSE means that we have to consider whether adjustments can be made to support the enrollment of students with challenging behavior. Um, it may in some circumstances, and this is made easier in these post-COVID days of our superior online learning offerings, it may be appropriate in some circumstances to require a student, a student whose behavior uh, poses a threat, for example, to uh, students or staff, it may be reasonable to require them not to enter the campus. Now we can facilitate this with online learning. Um, there will be students, students with disability that restraining orders have been taken up against by staff members at university. I'm thinking of one case called the Firestone case. And in that case, it was held that it was reasonable that the student's access to the physical campus be blocked because of his threatening and abusive behavior. Uh, a good, some quotes on that slide as well, you might like to look at later. Uh, the Zhang case, which was a case brought against um, UTAS, so some of you listening might be familiar with this case. It was an interesting case for a number of reasons, but the takeaway message that I want you to have today about this case is that when you are managing the enrollment of a student with a disability, you have extra obligations under the DSE, but you mustn't forget that they are still students of the university. And so the protocols that are in place for managing breaches of behavior codes that apply to students without disability must also be applied to students with disability. And one of the judges, uh, when this case went on appeal to the full federal court, would have found in favor of Zhang in that he, she had demonstrated to his satisfaction that the university had breached its own protocols in respect of managing um, the breaches alleged against her. Uh, of its, its behavior codes. Now that judge was in the minority to other judges found that there had been no discrimination, but it's nevertheless an interesting point. So I think that's it now. Um, sorry for that. It's a whirlwind tour of the issues. Got a couple of articles, a book chapter here and an article that you might find useful follow-up reading and where I can I talk about some of these issues in a lot more detail. Both of them you should be able to access through my ePrints page at QUT. So if you go to uh, ePrints at qut.edu.au, search for me, you should bring up um, versions of these uh, two things that you can read. Right. So thank, thank you very much. A lot of cans of worms, I know. Hope I haven't stood on too many toes. <laughs> no, it's been absolutely fabulous. And the amount of questions that we have, uh, um, we've never actually generated this many questions. Um, with the time we have, we're not going to get to, we'll only probably get to one. Um, so do apologise to people. We will work with Elizabeth on answering them in some way. So when you receive the link, we might have that there or we'll send out another link when we get the questions answered because there's some really insightful questions. Um, and people have upvoted. Um, and yeah, so the one the, the one that's got the eight, eight votes so far is could you define what tests 
of reasonableness that the court will use to determine what is and is not reasonable adjustments. Um, so this was kind of about a, a request that um, we get quite often for universities and, and TAFEs to have um, recording, le lectures recorded, and some academics refuse to have that happen. And if somebody has a, a who has ADHD or other um, specific learning disabilities require, you know, to be able to hear something over and over again to, to you know, take in, um, yeah. is that a reasonable request? Um, and how would a court, yeah. or is it hard to provide that answer? <laughs> Um, look, uh, you know, I'm going to give you the, the the lawyer type answer to start with, which is that yep. every case turns on its facts and the way the balancing of these competing um, relevant circumstances is handled will determine on the facts of the particular case. But I can say that at some universities, like my university, every lecture is recorded. Now, if University A can provide recordings of every lecture, why can't University B? And if I were trying to bring that case to court, that would be an argument that I would be running. If it's reasonable at University A, a big um, CBD-based, you know, 35,000 student university, would it be? Yeah be reasonable at another university as well. Yep. I know that there are some academics that will push back against that, but I guess it's it's about creating a, a culture at the university that this is just what happens. This is just what we do. Um, yep. Now, a brilliant yeah. answer. It's why you're a good lawyer. <laughs> well, you're, you're not a lawyer. Well, no, I'm not. I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm not, not a lawyer. A, but a, yeah, yeah. I'm not a lawyer. I'm, yep. I'm an academic. But yep. um, <laughs> Yeah, uh, the, the other thing is that um, uh, there are adjustments that may be able to be made to mitigate against the impact of the absence of a recording. I know that they are usually, uh, I would think, much more expensive. So, for example, I had a student once who was um, hearing impaired, and even though the lecture was recorded and a transcript, was then ultimately generated using um, speech to text um, software. Uh, the university also provided signing for this student. Now I've only had that happen once. So she got like the trifecta of a recording, a transcript and signing. Um, that was a smaller, inter more interactive class. And even though she didn't take advantage of the availability of the, the a person signing to do this, I inferred that the reason um, for the signing was in case she wanted to ask questions. So she had someone there uh, available to translate essentially um, mm -hmm. for me. But um, yeah. I yeah, mean, no, it's good. All right. Well, thank you. Yeah. No, I think you've answered that yeah. well. Yeah, no, it's yeah. great. Um, I just wanted to grab one more question. And, and as I said, there are so many. Um, this one kind of talked about the need for more um, knowledge and, and understanding of standards um, and also, you know, education across the whole sector, I think, um, you know, disability practitioners as well as academics. But uh, just one of the questions I wanted to have as your last thoughts, what are your thoughts on the current utility of the standards? Do you, do you believe that they are still fit for purposes? And if so, how do we, you believe that the standards could better serve students with disability? Um, look, I, I, think that, I think that those of us who've been working in universities for a long time, I think we can still point to... Um, situations where universities could do better. There are still some, some failings. You know, universities, if you look behind the institution, there are people, people are human, there may be the odd failing. But I think objectively, it's undeniable that the service delivery to people with disabilities now is better than it has ever been before. And that is largely on account of the excellent um, disability advisor staff that the universities have. And I was privileged to work for many years as chair of our Disability Services Working Party with um, the DAs at um, QUT. Hello to any of you who might be listening. And I learned so much from 
them. I know they liked sort of being able to talk to me about, you know, legal issues, but I learned so much from them. So, you know, there are good people being hired to do good things, but there may still be some failings. How could the DSE be improved? I would like to see, but I don't think it will ever happen, some kind of external monitoring of compliance, which would take away a lot of the pressure on students who in reality are still the ones that have to go to court to force non-compliant institutions kicking and screaming to change um, if there were some external monitoring body that that would help that but yeah. that would be expensive and <laughs> um, I don't think there is any government will to deliver something like that at present okay so well that's brilliant we are out of time I thank you so much Elizabeth um this has been one of the most engaging um webinars we've had the questions from everybody and the chat has been has blown my mind it's been absolutely fabulous thank you yeah. to everybody that's participated happy, so fully yeah. I'm happy to to do it again if you want to yeah. look at some do a you know like have a a more elaborate interactive look at brilliant. um you know, particular issues I'm very happy um Excellent. You know, you're, yep. all you people listening, you make my job easier. <laughs> That's too. great. So, Excellent. So yeah. we'll, um, we do send out a survey to people, which I think has just gone into the um, chat or go out into the email. If people have suggestions on what they'd like Elizabeth to cover in the future, that would be great because, um, yeah, we'd love to keep this relationship going. Your wisdom um, and experience has just, uh, yeah, has been absolutely wonderful. We've also put into the link, um, into the chat, a link to our next one, which will be with Headspace and the program that they're offering to university at the moment around mental health conditions. So please um, join us for that one. So I will close now, but... Um, I, as I said, we could keep this going forever, but I really appreciate it, um, Elizabeth. It's been great to hear your knowledge and expertise. And thank you, everybody, for joining us. Have a great day. Thank you. And, Thanks for inviting um, me. Okay. Take care, everybody. Bye.